Hi there everyone, Steve the Amateur Historian here with you again with another story coming out of a very tumultuous period in crime for all of America in addition to Oregon during the kind of the 70s into the 80s. The early 80s is where everything was the worst. But in particular, it's a very interesting thing. And this is going to be kind of a series of videos that I do on these cases. I started it really with the kind of in-depth film I did on William Scott Smith, serial killer who went to prison for murdering two women in 1984. And then in 2007, he was also finally found guilty of the murder of Sherry uh, Ierly in 1982 in Salem, uh, which was a cold case uh, for a very long time. And as I've kind of researched crime in recent Oregon history, there's this plethora of cases that either went entirely unsolved or unsolved for a lengthy period of time. Uh, primarily out of the Salem area, which Salem is the capital of Oregon. It's about 40 miles south of Portland. And from the early 70s into the mid 80s, there was just this string of random murders, many of which didn't go solved for a very long period of time or haven't been solved at all. And I really want to talk about a lot of these cases because a lot of them are very obscure. You're not going to really find videos about many of them on YouTube. Or, you know, you're not going to find a lot of information about them on the internet in general unless you really dig deep. So I really want to talk about a lot of these cases because a lot of them are these brutal murders of young women in Salem that have gone more or less forgotten. And in this particular one, I'm going back to 1971, the summer of 1971, and the very tragic, troubling murder of a 26-year-old woman who worked for the State Welfare Division, I believe, who was named Catherine Fenning Owens. So, Catherine Owens, more known by people who knew her closely as Kathy Owens, is discovered on the morning of July 30th, 1971, in her apartment by a co-worker of hers at the Welfare Division who went to, I can only assume, check up on her when she didn't show up for work that day. She showed up at Owens' apartment and discovered her dead, strangled to death with her own nightgown. It was discovered pretty quickly how the perpetrator had gained entry. A screen in a living room window in her apartment had been slit and that window had been left cracked open so it was really easy to cut the screen and then push the window open and sneak into her apartment. Her bedroom door had a little hook that you could use to lock uh, the door, but that when the scene was found, that door had not been locked. And this crime uh, was very troubling because of the type of person that Kathy Owens was known to be, a very uh, productive, very successful uh, person. She was going to get married soon. She had a fiancé. Um, she was just very young, very intelligent, very beautiful, just very everything you'd want in a decent human being. She was apparently incredibly nice. Um, she'd been a teacher during the 1960s and she was only in her mid-20s. She had presumably a lot 
left to accomplish and to bring to this world in her remaining years, and it was all taken away in the blink of an eye. And it was a crime that would go unsolved for many years. They had potential suspects. There was a guy, uh, last name of Stark, who a couple months after Owens was found dead, and they'd done testing on whatever evidence they could find. It was going nowhere. Apparently this guy named Stark, who lived in an apartment fairly close to where um, Owens' apartment was located, he was picked up on a sodomy charge, which is disgusting in and of itself. But while he was in jail, the police actually searched his apartment and it was in direct relation to Kathy Owens' murder. This guy had apparently made uh, comments that suggested he knew details of the crime scene, which you wouldn't have known at that time unless you were there. And he'd been given a polygraph test on in regards to the facts of the case that he had failed. So this guy got a lot of attention put on him, uh, but ultimately it just didn't go anywhere. They just couldn't find enough to try this guy on. There was apparently a uh, footprint that was found, I want to say in the bathroom of the home, that didn't match um, this Stark guy. Now it's known that the fiance of Kathy Owens had visited her. Maybe the footprint matched him. But either way, it didn't match this Stark guy. And they'd found hairs at the crime scene, the, um, but they couldn't be matched to this Stark guy. There just wasn't enough to bring charges on the guy, and he would never be charged. And it's known the night of July 29th, 1971, that Kathy was alive and well. She'd been seen by people who lived in her apartment complex. Her fiancé had come and visited her. And another woman, an elderly woman that lived in the apartment complex named Velma Barches, I think is how it's pronounced, she had spoken to Kathy uh, the night of the 29th, and she'd actually been awoken around 2 a.m. after hearing sounds. She left her window cracked and she could hear the footsteps of somebody seemingly running from the area. And she went to the window and caught a glimpse of, you know, actually somebody running away from the area and was able to give something of a description of that individual. And apparently the Stark character somewhat matched that description. So even with that, I mean, that was one of the few things the authorities had to go on was this general description of someone fleeing the scene around 2 a.m. And it was determined that... Kathy Owens was murdered sometime between midnight and 2 a.m., so it was probably closer to 2 a.m. in that regard that she was actually murdered. And the years pass. It's approaching the 80s now. Kathy is murdered in the summer of 1971. It's now 1978, and there is a young man by the name of William Thomas who is arrested in Marion County, which that's where Salem is. So he's arrested in the vicinity, generally, of where Owens lived. And he's arrested for sex abuse against the stepchildren, against his own stepchildren of a woman he'd been married to. And obviously that marriage was going south very quick, and he actually was in jail on those charges. And... It would come out during this time period, um, you know, you never want to rely on kind of a jailhouse snitch, but in this case, someone who was in jail with Thomas said that he had started talking about some rape he'd committed earlier, among many other cases. Um, but there was one that he'd admitted to doing several years before, so, you know, seven years earlier, in 1971, the murder of Kathy Owens... You know, is there a connection there? Is that the crime that this guy is talking about? So authorities start talking to Thomas and they start analyzing the things that they have. There's hair at the scene. There's a semen. And they're ultimately able to connect certain pieces of evidence to this William Thomas guy. And he admits pretty quickly to being the killer. He was only like 17 when he did it, but he admitted... To being the killer of Kathy Owens. So while this case, you know, was another case that, you know, was so brutal and it took so long uh, before a perpetrator was captured, which I mean, 
is beneficial considering the number of cold cases that have come out of that area for, during the 1970s. But, you know, Thomas was only like a teenager when this happened. And he was interviewed, and a lot of the details, the intricate details about Thomas and this uh, murder and how he uh, pulled it off, uh, come from a book that Anne Rule, a really well-known uh, true crime author, had written about. She's um, She lived a lot of her life in the Pacific Northwest, maybe still does. She knew Ted Bundy directly, and she's written a lot on cases out of Pacific Northwest, Washington and Oregon specifically. And she wrote, uh, you know, a pretty detailed um, story about Thomas under a different name in regards to his murdering of Kathy Owens. And it's even discovered that during the summer of 1971, when Kathy Owens was murdered, William Thomas was living with his family less than a mile away from where Kathy Owens' apartment was located. And shortly after she was murdered, he split and went and stayed with family all the way over in Minnesota. So it seems like he was probably, you know, more or less fleeing the scene of his crime. And William Thomas, this is a very troubling guy. This is a guy that's had a past, -ish, um, you know, record with drugs, but his extensive history of sex abuse is what's really troubling. Sexually assaulting women of age and underage girls, um, it seemed like, you know, there was no low that this guy wouldn't stoop to to get what he wanted. But it really peaked with Kathy Owens. Now, while being talked to, Thomas never admitted to ever killing another woman. He admitted to other sex assault crimes that were incredibly troubling. Um, but he always maintained that Kathy Owens was his only killing. And he also said that he didn't intend on killing her. It seemed like he had definitely a fetish for uh, sexually assaulting, you know, young women and underage girls. But he made mention that he always wanted the women to be unconscious, you know, like, assuming so they wouldn't fight back or so he could do anything his heart desired without there being any rejection of any kind. And that was his thing, and that was more or less how Kathy Owens ended up dying. It was determined that she, again, had been strangled to death with her own nightgown, and Thomas admitted to doing this. Uh, yeah, God. William Thomas, uh, you know, he was a high school dropout. He had told another story about where he was down along the rural area, presumably along Santee Am River, which kind of runs near Salem. Now he saw a young girl riding a bicycle and enticed her over to him. Didn't kill her and didn't rape her, but he admitted to like fondling her and getting physically active with her, which if it's an underage girl, that still counts, dude. Um, but the, the one thing, I mean, beyond the murder of Kathy Owens, which obviously I'm not finished discussing, this was what really grabbed my attention was while he was talking to authorities and admitting to these other sex assaults, he admitted to committing a psycho-like um, assault on a woman, only he didn't kill her. Now, when I say a psycho style assault, I'm referencing the Alfred Hitchcock movie, Psycho, which was released in 1960 and has one of the most iconic scenes in the history of cinema, which is where the lead character, played by Janet Leigh, is taking a shower and then Norman Bates, uh, the killer, walks in dressed more or less like his mother, opens the curtain and with a knife hacks Janet Leigh's character to death in the shower. Well, I guess sometime during the 1970s, William Thomas admitted breaking into a woman's house while she was in the shower. He went into the bathroom and literally threw the curtains open and had a knife. Now, he didn't kill her, but at knife point, he forced this woman to commit oral sex on him at knife point. So, that's... The key difference in this case is he didn't just throw the, throw the, you know, 
shower curtain open and murder this woman. It doesn't, murder wasn't his real drive. It was the sex assault and rape that drove this guy. So I thought that was just so bizarre that he committed this assault on a woman that was so in sync with this iconic scene from the 1960 film Psycho. That really threw me. And he admitted that, you know, as early as the age of 13, he had taken to voyeurism. And he had started, uh, you know, sneaking out at night. He apparently was a very much a homebody. He wouldn't go out during the day. He didn't really have any friends. Didn't have any girlfriends. He was very ostracized from society and very much kept to himself. But he would sneak out at night and look through, um, you know, he was a peeping Tom. He would look through the windows of places where women lived. I'm assuming a lot of them were women that lived alone so he could, you know, have them to himself, so to speak. And, you know, through the process of doing this, he lived nearby, he stumbled onto Kathy Owens' apartment, and she became a woman that he was fixated on, and he would peep through her windows numerous times. I guess the way her shutters were set up, they very seldomly would close all the way, so we always knew if he went to her place and she was in her room, he could peep on her. And that, this really uh, got to me, um, and I'm about to reveal something that, um, from deep in my past, that it really, the, hearing about this guy being so young and becoming a peeping Tom, uh, it reminded me of something from my past. I don't, don't worry, I'm not going to admit to some sex assault that I committed, because that has not happened. But, um, again, you know, it's just, it's, it's the mindset of, you know, a young, confused person. And I, I've mentioned numerous times on my channel that I was a very... Uh, I didn't understand it at the time, but now being a fully grown adult and putting that time of my life into perspective, I was a very misguided, very troubled, very isolated and confused young teen. And right around this same age, when I was about 13, I developed a fixation on a woman that lived in our apartment complex. We lived in unit one, she lived two units down in unit three. And she was, for most of the time she lived there, she was a single woman, probably in her late 20s, very attractive. And I started becoming fixated on her. Now, you know, this is, I don't want to get too detailed about me at this time, but it's, you know, a little while after puberty and I was probably discovering, you know, more intense, you know, sexually driven feelings. And there, there was never anything troubling. I never had the drive to attack this woman, to assault her, or anything like this. I was just very sexually attracted to her. And I would start, because she had to walk from her apartment past mine to get to her cars in the parking lot. And I started, like, you know, realizing, you know, when she would leave for work, and I would always, like, sneak up to our living room window and watch her walk by and kind of ogle her. And I remember one time again, I'm probably like 13, where she left her home and it was nighttime and it was dark out. And I walked around our apartments and then you go around her unit, which was at the end. And it was very easy to get into people's backyards because the fencing there was only about this high and every fence was closed off with a lock, a little lock that just kind of went like that. And you could reach over the fence and just lift the lock and pull the gate open. And I snuck into her backyard. Um, again, I didn't ever want to do this when she was home. I didn't want to scare this woman or anything. But still, my fixation on her was so much to the point that when she was gone, I literally snuck into her backyard and went up to her back door. And I almost just wanted to like see into her apartment or something. I really don't understand what, especially now, I don't understand what I was thinking. I was a very troubled youth. And for a brief second, I didn't do it. I had just enough common sense, apparently, but I honestly contemplated trying to open her, her back door to see if it, it probably wasn't unlocked. But I contemplated trying to open her door and sneak into her apartment. And it was like, I wanted to like, you know, touch the clothes that I saw her wearing every day or whatever. It was very, very strange. And it was part of this, this element of voyeurism that I had, like when I was like 13, 14, and 15, 
And I was also a very introverted person. I would never had a girlfriend. I, even as, you know, a young teen, I felt very sexually repressed to, certain, to a certain extent. And it was like hearing about this guy being 13 and peeping in on people's windows. It brought that memory back to me. And again, you know, I never, again, obviously never had the objective of attacking someone, breaking into their home and assaulting anyone, doing anything close to what this guy did. But still, it brought chills to me even all these years later, thinking about how I was almost kind of doing something similar to what this guy was doing, even though I'd only done it like one time. And for this guy, it was like, it was a deeply, it was a deep fetish for this guy. And I think the more he peeped, the more he wanted to see, the more he wanted to expand. Um, he admitted one of the many reasons he kept returning to Kathy Owens' apartment was he wanted to see her nude. And he just never could quite do that. And he said that um, in the later hours of January 29th, he went there and she was at home and her fiance was there with him or with her. And so he just sat out there and waited. And he said he just waited and waited for hours before the guy finally left. And then Kathy apparently took a shower and when she got out and went into her room, she was naked and he apparently for a lengthy period of time was able to stare through her window and watch her naked. And I think that was, you know, with these like serial offenders and you think of potential serial killers, while this guy doesn't necessarily, at least he hasn't admitted to another killing, he obviously was a serial offender in that Every, things seemed to, you know, increase, you know, at first it was just peeping in on women was all it took. And then it became actually wanting them, wanting to see them nude. And then from there it had to escalate to the next level, which was wanting to engage sexually with these women and then to engage sexually with them against their will to rape and to assault them to the point that by 1978, when this guy finally admits to this murder, he's in jail for sexually assaulting his own stepchildren. It's that kind of thing that happens with a lot of serial killers. You know, a lot of serial killers, when they're young, will like brutalize, you know, toys they have, or they'll kill animals. And then it transitions from brutally murdering animals to assaulting people. Um, a lot of uh, serial killers who are, you know, rape and murder women, a lot of them start as just rapists. And then it transitions from rape and then murder. Or, you know, the rape is the murder. And it seems very much the case for William Thomas that Kathy Owens, unfortunately, it was that moment where suddenly peeping wasn't enough for this guy. And he said he sat there as she went to sleep and contemplated and struggled with himself about whether he wanted to sneak into the sneak into her apartment and then finally you know he had a knife with him a pocket knife he decided to sneak in and he cut the screen and opened the window and snuck into her living room and he spoke about sitting outside of her uh bedroom in her living room and it's like he's just he's right at that point where he's gonna kick things up a notch and he's just like contemplating it and contemplating it and i think initially it's just the thrill of getting into her apartment but she's in there, and so then it becomes wanting to be in her bedroom with her. And then it progresses, and he was able to use his pocket knife to stick through the, you know, the, between the frame and the door and unlock that hook that I mentioned. They talked about how she had a hook lock on her bedroom door, and when they showed up, obviously that door hadn't been locked. Well, it had been locked. Uh, but Thomas was able to use his little knife to stick it through the door and pop the lock off and he was able to get into her bedroom. And again, he talks about kind of looming over her and contemplating what to do. And it's like each next moment, he goes from the outside into the living room and has to go from the living room to her bedroom. Now he's in the room with her. And it's a very troubling murder. He leaps on top of her, wakes her up, she starts struggling with him, and he apparently grabs some Kleenex tissue nearby and starts stuffing it down her throat. And it's like, he's trying to render her unconscious because again, he wants to assault her without her being awake. And she apparently ended up swallowing it um, and probably choking on it. He claims that while he assaulted her, he thought she was still breathing. And then um, 
he proceeded to, and it was obvious he, you know, the way he described it, he didn't really know what he was doing, and it was kind of like he started like fondling her, and it's like he didn't really know what to do. But he even mentioned at one point, this was really strange, he um, said that he had set up a mirror there by the bed so he could watch himself sexually assaulting Kathy Owens. Um, and then ultimately, even when he was being interviewed about it in 1978, he said he didn't really know why. He just got mad and he like took her nightgown and wrapped it around her neck and choked her with it and left it like that. He later said that he kind of, you know, tried to take it off after, but it was too tight. So, you know, in addition to the tissue he'd stuffed down her throat, he'd also like choked her to death with this nightgown. And he said that he assaulted her more after he had wrapped uh, her nightgown around her throat. And then he got up and he used a scarf that was in the apartment to wipe down anything he had touched, which, you know, helped him. Um, he obviously wasn't tracked down shortly after because he left any major clue at the crime scene. And he left. And, you know, again, it's around 2 a.m. that one of Kathy's neighbors hears uh, a commotion and footsteps running and goes for a window and sees someone running away from the apartment complex. And even Thomas admitted leaving the apartment somewhere around 2 a.m., 2.30 a.m. And he actually, when he got home, he had... Um, made a habit of being pretty stealthy about pretty much going to bed, making his parents think he was asleep, and then sneaking out through his window, leaving it cracked, and then sneaking back in after he'd gone around peeping in on women. But on this night, he gets home, you know, somewhere before 3 a.m., and his dad had apparently put in a new screen on his window, and he couldn't get in through his own window, so he had to go in through the front door. And when his family saw him coming in so late, he made up some story about going to some new cafe in town or something, some stupid story. And, you know, no one was ever all that suspicious about him. So he got away with it for a very long time. But then, you know, that was presumably one of his first direct sexual assaults on someone. He was still underaged, and it's presumably his only murder, although... You know, who can say for certain, just because the guy said he hasn't murdered anyone else certainly doesn't mean he's being fully honest. Even though he was so direct and forward, you know, it's, it's, it's like that sick psychosis about being so controlled by these fetishes and these sick, twisted motivations that drive you to be a repeat sex offender um, on girls and women of various ages that... Even when he's being talked to by the police, he's openly discussing these other sex assaults that he isn't being charged for. Even though he could potentially get in more trouble by admitting this, he's just telling them these stories. You know, he's like, I never murdered anyone else, but I did assault this woman and I did sexually assault that woman. And it's like, you're pretty far gone when you're just openly admitting to assaulting other women that you are not. Nobody's suspicious about you for. Very troubling. And so he is, fortunately, finally in the, I want to say, uh, summer, later summer, 1978, he's convicted of second-degree murder because it doesn't seem like he really intended on even killing Kathy based on his story. You know, take that as you will, but it seems more like he just wanted to render her unconscious so he could assault her that way, and she ended up dying as a result of it. Um... Again, believe things went down however you want to, but I think that prevented him from being charged with first-degree murder. But because it wasn't a first-degree murder charge, he was only sentenced to 25 years in prison, even though this guy had literally choked this woman to death and assaulted her for a lengthy period of time, even though this guy was already in jail for assaulting underage children. He'd had these other you know, sexual assaults that he'd openly admitted to, and yet the guy only got charged with 25 years. He was then released from prison in 1990. The guy barely served 12 years in prison, if that. So by 1990, the guy's only in his mid-30s. He was back out on the street. You know, just, you know, an unfortunate example of 
the prison system a lot of times. I mean, you know, you're likely going to get out of prison pretty quick if you're not given a life sentence, and he was not given a life sentence in this case. So, that means this lunatic, theoretically, has been out on the loose for almost 30 years now. Now, I wasn't really able to find any more information on him other than the fact that he was released from prison in 1990. My hopes is that that means the guy either calmed down or dropped off the face of the earth if he couldn't. Uh, one or the other works just fine for me. Lo and behold, you do a little bit of research. I had never heard about this until just moments ago. Hoping that this guy would have faded into obscurity, because at least when you're lost to obscurity, you're not out there threatening the lives of other people. Well, William Thomas is released from prison on parole at the start of the 1990s. I discover by 1999 he is living in Albany, Oregon, which is a little bit south of Salem. It's kind of wedged between Salem and Eugene, more or less. And by the early 2000s, he's in a relationship with a woman named Laura Culbertson. And on her birthday, August 17th, 2004, according to the information I found, he struck her, and that's what killed her. I'm assuming that translates to he hit her with something. It was some form of blunt force trauma, but that's pretty much what is repeated in the newspaper articles during this time. 2004, um, a little over a decade after he's released from prison on parole, barely serving over like 12 years for a murder he admits to back in 1971. Late 2004, he is back in the spotlight for killing his girlfriend. I... I shouldn't have tempted fate when I thought, okay, haven't been able to find anything about him, so hopefully that means everything's been all right. And of course it's not. He went on trial, and in 2005 he was given... What he should have been given back in 1978, but unfortunately the laws were different back then. He was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole, which without the possibility of parole is always a malleable term. But the guy is, let's see, he says he was 50 in 2004, so he's in his early 60s now. So hopefully if the possibility of parole ever comes about, he's going to be on his deathbed practically. But... The alternative is he just hopefully spends the rest of his life in jail, which even he said when he went on trial for this crime was the best thing to possibly happen. Put me in prison or I'm kept away from people. So, I certainly don't think of the guy as a serial killer. It seems like this case, similar to Kathy Owens, it seems like the intent probably wasn't to commit murder. They... Something happened, an argument, I don't know, that led him to lashing out against her violently, and that ended up leading to her death. So, while I was thinking this guy's been paroled for a long time and he's wandering the streets, he hasn't been wandering the streets for over 13 years now. He is in prison for killing another person. And... Uh, you know, if you're a University of Oregon student, which I know back in like 2010, I was planning on transferring to University of Oregon. It didn't quite happen for certain reasons. And you know, even as a kid, I always wanted to go to University of Oregon. I wanted to go to the university of the state that I went to. And being a writer and whatnot, and Oregon having a pretty decent communications program, it all just seemed perfect. So I've always been a big, a big fan of there. And I enjoy Eugene whenever I visit. But Kathy Owens was... A, um, she had graduated University of Oregon, I want to say like 19, mid-60s, if she was 26 in 1971. And in the aftermath of her death, they actually established a scholarship for her, which I believe goes to uh, students who um, 
are going to University of Oregon for law. I can only assume that means that she went to University of Oregon Law School. So if you're a potential law school student looking into getting financial aid, going to the University of Oregon, you're probably going to stumble onto something called the Catherine Fenning Owen Scholarship. Well, if you stumble onto that, um, either to look at or to apply for it, that same uh, Catherine Owens is the woman that I've been talking about, obviously, in this video, who had so much potential, being only 26 when she died, and had her life so horribly, so meaninglessly cut short. I mean, the murders of just about anyone are meaningless, because seldom does anybody do anything to anyone else that justifies them being killed. And in this case, Kathy Owens didn't even know her attacker. And it seems based on his account, the attacker didn't even have the intent on killing her. It's really about as meaningless and as senseless as it gets. And in that vein, guys, that's a wrap on this troubling murder from out of the 1970s that, again, during this period of several years, there's so many crazy murder cases that came out of the Salem, Oregon area that I will be doing follow-up videos on. So it's almost going to kind of be a series of videos that I do. And till the next video, till that next one in this series, remember, as always, I try to make this shorter and shorter with these videos because I hate asking all that YouTube nonsense after talking about these horrible crimes. All of a sudden, asking for subscriptions and follows and whatnot seems so petty and insignificant when you talk about lives that have been lost by people in such horrible ways. <sighs> but I still have to suck it up and do it. Anyway, <laughs> remember to like, share, subscribe to my channel if you want. Thank you so much for making it all the way through this video. And if you want to help me financially, please hit up my Patreon page. The link is in the description. Until next time, guys, this has been Steve the Amateur Historian.